Hello and welcome back to another fabulous episode of It's Always Sunny in Hollywood. I am your host, Derek Lugia, and I am joined today by... My name is Patrick, and why are the icons so small? What is this, a podcast for ants? I'm a model. My name is Hansel Jamarts. Wow. <laughs> Shit, I need to get the voice. It's <laughs> Yeah, uh, we're talking about Zoolander today. Yes, also a happy Easter and happy day of trans visibility. Yes, also a few of my friends um, live in other parts of the world. So for them right now, it is uh, April Fool's Day. So also happy April Fool's Day, I guess. I would argue that uh, Jesus resurrecting himself was a pretty, pretty in insane prank on the Romans. They didn't expect that. Surprise, you're on wow. candid camera. This movie came out right after 9-11. That's crazy. That is going to be uh, relevant a little bit later. Some uh, sad news. Um, I mean, 9-11 is sad news to uh, in Jesus dying. But um, more uh, modern sad news. Uh, Louis uh, Gossett Jr. Uh, unfortunately passed away. He was an American actor. Uh, basically, he he's... Um, he was one of the first uh, black men to ever win um, an Oscar. He won. He was the first black man to win a uh, best uh, a supporting actor, actor uh, Oscar. He's uh, 87 years old. I guess some uh, flicks you might know him from is uh, he was in the miniseries Roots, and he won an Emmy for that. He was in a lot of plays. So I don't know if you've heard of him, but uh, A Raisin in the Sun, The Blacks, uh, Tambourines to Glory, and Zulu and the Zaya. And the Zeta, the Zulu and the Zeta, and uh, Take a Giant Step. Those are all the plays he's kind of mostly known for. He won the Oscar for uh, An Officer and a Gentleman, and uh, which came out in 1982. That seems a bit late for him to, for that, that to be the first black man to win an Oscar. 80, 1982, that's crazy. Damn, I thought that was like earlier or some shit. That doesn't sound right. Yeah, I mean, he's not like the first black man to win an Oscar ever, because like lead actors have won. Uh, but like, but this was for crazy. this was for what what role? Supporting actor. What category? Supporting okay. Actor. Yeah. Still, that 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 doesn't sound right. But if that's what's documented, then yeah. Uh, Sidney Poitier. Well, he was like the he's probably the one most people are more familiar with. He's the one that beat out. He won that f the first uh, black Oscar, and he got that in like I think like the '60s or some shit. One last bit of news. This is something minor, but it caught my attention. So, story time. Uh, several years back, they made a fourth live-action Diary of a Wimpy Kid movie. Fans hated it, critics hated it, audiences hated it. Nobody liked it, and a main reason for that was because they had a completely different cast, and this spawned a the uh, hashtag NotMyRoderick meme. And just this past week, the guy who played Roderick opened up about it, I'm just going to come out and say, I've never seen the movie before. I don't really care. He did not deserve any of the criticism he got for it. Like, that's, that, like, the casting, that's on the studios and stuff. He's just, he's just a guy trying to work. And people just didn't accept him as a replacement? No. And he, he opened up about this, how the meme kind of put him into a depression for three years. It wasn't serious, like, he never thought of taking his own life, but... He said it. He said because he was like a teenager at the time, there wasn't really anybody he could turn to to help him. He hasn't really done any acting since. Granted, he said acting wasn't really his passion, but at the same time, the hate was completely ridiculous. Even at the time, I was like, leave the guy, leave the guy alone. Like, he's just he's just working. He had no input on whether or not they decided to make another movie. He's just trying to make money. Go after the studio all you want, but like, don't go after him. At least he's doing all right. And the way things kind of work is like, even if you are making fun of uh, just the studio, you know, he's going to get in the crossfire regardless. Because if you're saying, yeah, but oh, like... you made a bad casting decision, you're still insulting him. But, you know, when I saw the video, he seemed, he didn't really seem to mind. But like, obviously, with uh, every situation, you got some people that go too far, which is uh, more what he was talking about. I mean, every time anything gets criticism, there's always... um. You know, plenty of people who do it normally, but then people who go too far. He said you know, he said he got death stuff. threats for it. Like that is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, any any time there's any controversy ever, there's death threats. It's I don't know. 
I don't know why. People that do still it doesn't really make it right. Like, it's a freaking Diary of a Wimpy Kid movie. Like, I get, like, it's, like, a nostalgic property, and people, like, like the original movies, but do you really have nothing better to do? I was going to feel a little bit ironic with uh, what I'm saying next, but uh, they announced a Night of the Hunter remake, which uh, we watched on the show before. You guys remember that? I do. Mm-hmm. The Hands of Love and Hate. Yeah, so, so yeah, they announced that they're going to remake that film, and uh, obviously, people aren't taking uh, too kindly to that, and uh, it's been getting a lot of criticism. How are they going um, about this remake? Are they trying to modernize it? Is it going for a specific style? Does it look like well, it's not trying to be the original film? Well, here's the thing. Most people are just criticizing that it, it's completely unnecessary. Like, it makes no sense to remake it. Night of the Hunter, um, it's not like a, a super like famous movie, but among people that know it, it's like so highly regarded. Basically, announcing a Night of the Hunter remake to most people is like if you announce that you're making a sequel to Citizen Kane, which is like absurd, right? Like, if someone announced that, you know, we're doing um, Citizen Kane 2, I feel like most people would be like, shut the fuck up, what are you talking about? Which is, um, yeah, so most people are just kind of like opposed to the idea, and um, when like asked about like why they're making it, the only justification he really gave is that, oh, well, um, because of the Hayes Code, you know, there was some uh, stuff from the original book that uh, you couldn't, you know, get away with uh, back then, so that uh, to cut it. And everyone else is like, like so what, you know? Because, um, I don't know if you guys know this, you know the Maltese Falcon, the movie? I've Maltese heard of it. Falcon? I've never I, seen it. I can't say I do. Okay, so it's considered a film noir classic, one of the best film noirs ever made. It's technically a remake of a movie, uh, from the 1930s, so it's a 1940s movie, and then 10 years earlier, before the Hays Code, they also, like, made a, a Maltese Falcon adaptation. And the uh, original was, since it was before the Hays Code, it had, like, all the inappropriate stuff that you couldn't get away with during the Hays Code. And despite that, nobody cares. Everyone likes the, the censored, you know, the one that was made under censorship more than the original that has all the uh, edgier stuff. And you, you know why? Is because John Huston is a better director than um, well, whoever did the original. You know, better actors, better um, uh, Roy Del Ruth. That guy did the original. Like Roy Del Ruth, he's just like a standard director. There's nothing like really notable about him. But The Maltese Falcon was directed by one of the greatest directors of his time, starring some of the greatest actors of his time. You know, Humphrey Bogart, uh, Peter Lore. You know, these are you know legends. And the original was just. There's nothing that notable about it, basically. Which is why everyone prefers the censored version. So, like, the idea with, like, a Night of the Hunter remake is, like, yeah, you can, like, put in a, a few darker things than um, what wasn't in the original film. But, like, the original film was plenty dark. And also, Charles Lawton is, like, a great actor. I mean, as a great director. And, you know, Robert Mitchum. Who could you even get to play, like, someone like Robert Mitchum nowadays? Or So, yeah. This is a studio who's making a kind of dumb decision. Um, this technically isn't the first remake of Night of the Hunter. I don't know if you guys, like, remember this practice. I mean, probably not, because this practice was dead by the time we were kids. But um, there used to be this common practice of people making uh, TV remakes of classic films. Just really weird. Like, there's a TV I do remember that. There's, like, a TV version of Carrie. So there, there is a TV remake of Night of the Hunter in, like, 1991. Obviously, this is, like... Whatever the TV economy is like a little bit different than whatever is going on. But yeah, the new Night of the Hunter is a... Uh... Is this new movie going to be theatrical or streaming? No idea. Okay. But the director Do, like, is... We uh, don't know anything about it. We know the director and he says that he's uh, doing it because um, he thought that the original uh, wasn't, you know, didn't, didn't have like all the dark elements. He's like, this is the only reason. And everyone's like... That's not, like, good enough justification to remake a classic, you know? Anything else? Nope. Land of Zoo. All right. Yes. So, Zoolander was directed by Ben Stiller and released on September 28th, 2001. It had a budget of $28 million, and it made around $60 million, so it was it was kind of big for the time. Uh, And I have a... I have a Quite the list of fun facts, so uh, I'll, I'll try to breeze through these as much as possible. So, Zoolander hosts a lot, and I mean a lot, of celebrity cameos. 
Some of the most prominent ones in the film are uh, David Bowie and Billy Zane, but uh, we also had Fabio in there, Paris Hilton, Natalie Portman, and Fred Durst. And I... Where Keep was, on rolling, baby. Where was he in the movie? Because <laughs> that caught me off guard. I don't know, but the cameo that caught me off guard was James Marsden as John Wilkes Booth. <laughs> Yeah, there, um, there's like there, that, that was there's like, like almost I'm like over twenty celebrities. I'm, post I'm posting a screenshot of Fred Durst in the in the chat. It makes sense that you would not recognize him because they they really put him a lot of makeup on them. My God. Oh my, that was him. Yeah, he was he was the was. DJ. Oh my God. Okay, I I didn't put two and two together. Yeah, That's some damn good makeup then. Oh my God, that is crazy. All right, but uh, back on topic. So the character of Zoolander, or Derek Zoolander, was first created for a skit for the 1996 VH1 Fashion Awards, and the name was uh, kind of a conglomerate of two male models who worked for Calvin Klein, Mark Vanderloo and Johnny Zander, Vanderloo Zander, Zoolander. Uh, initially, Ben Stiller was going to play the role of Maury in the movie, as opposed to Derek. Uh, but later on, he decided that he would be Derek, and instead, he would give the role of Maury to uh, his father, Jerry Stiller. Oh, I didn't realize that was his dad. Cool. Yeah. He, he doesn't play his dad in the movie, but he plays like a father-like figure. Andy Dick would have played Mugatu, but he was busy with the TV show Go Fish, so we got Will Ferrell instead. Will Ferrell. <laughs> Will Ferrell Williams. Hell yeah. I've never heard anyone pronounce his name like that. How, how how do you pronounce it? Farrell? Yes, yeah, Will, Will Farrell. Farrell. Will Farrell. <laughs> you pronounce it like Farrell. Like Farrell, like the, the, the like Farrell Williams. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like, like it's like eight p.m. I barely ate. Cut me some slack. You barely ate on Easter. Mm -hmm. anyway, as you were. Uh, the opening scenes of Zoolander were filmed at the VH1 and Vogue Fashion Awards shows during commercial breaks. So this was kind of like a, a one-shot deal that they did, and they shot those scenes as fast as possible, which was kind of interesting. Uh, do you remember the character Pruitt in the movie that they meet in the cemetery? The, the hand model? Yes. Yes. So you know how, like, he explains the history of uh, presidential assassinations done by male models. And there's a joke there where Derek says, but why male models? Even though he asked the question again. Uh, that was improv. Mm -hmm. Ben Stiller didn't know the line. So he, he just did that by accident. And the actor who played oh, Bruce was like... Are you?" <laughs> he just went along with the bit and it worked. That was the yeah. take they used. David Duchovny. That did uh, that was, that kind was of feel like in character, too, so... That was a cameo too, by the way. That was a David Duchovny. The original ending of Zoolander uh, was nowhere near the same as the one we got. Instead, Derek would have been run over by a train and ascend to heaven. The reason why they didn't go through with it was because it went over budget. You, you probably wouldn't have gotten a Zoolander 2 then if Derek fucking died. You probably could have found a way to bullshit it. I guess. Maybe, maybe the Magnum is what brings him back to life. Zoolander was never shown in Malaysia because it depicts uh, the attempted assassination of the Prime Minister. And it was also banned in Singapore for a time due to some controversial elements, but in 2006 it was made available there. And in Asian releases, the name Malaysia was changed to Micronesia. Now, because of the... Uh, the release date for this movie being September 28th, 2001. Uh, we, we did mention this before. This was a couple weeks after 9-11. And the film was shot in New York, too. So what Ben Stiller did was he removed any traces of the Twin Towers digitally because he felt like that was the right thing to do at the time after an event like that. But there is a cut of the Twin Towers Restored for the 2016 Blu-ray uh, release. That might have been the version I saw, because I at least saw one shot with the towers in the background. And finally, this movie was accused for plagiarism, for having similarities with the novel Glamorama by Brett Easton Ellis. Brett Easton Ellis, uh, we're a fan of him here. Um, I think that's kind of funny, because 
when I saw the movie, the first thing I thought was that this is the same plot as the Manchurian Candidate, and I thought it was like a parody of it. But okay. How similar is the is Glamorama to the Manchurian Candidate then? That's I don't know, it. and apparently, uh, there isn't really a definitive answer for uh what happened afterwards because it was an out of court settlement. I can see like the broad similarity, but I feel like they kind of took it in a different direction. Also, knowing Brett Easton Ellison, you know who we know for the writer of American Psycho, I'm pretty sure his um his version of the vacuous male model is very different than uh Derek Zoolander. You know, I'm now I'm imagining Zoolander, but like with the Patrick Bateman's delivery is like, Father, <laughs> I think I have the black lung. <laughs> I don't think I can work in the mines anymore. There was a moment last night where she was sandwiched between two Finnish dwarves and a Maori tribesman where I thought, wow, I could spend the rest of my life with this woman. <laughs> oh, my God. That's, that's, a, actually kind that's of a game. Fits. That's a game. Zoolander quote or American Psycho quote? <laughs> Do you like Huey Lewis in the news? And, and you, ha you have to scrunch up your Let's face afterwards Hansel. when you say that. Impressive. Very nice. Let's see Hansel's card. But what is Zoolander about? Well, as you would have guessed, it is about Derek Zoolander, who is a male model and one of the best. He's won uh, best male model for three years in a row. That is until that title is quickly stripped away from him by his rival, Hansel, played by Owen Wilson. But he doesn't know yes. this at first. Even though Hansel won the award, Derek still went up on stage to claim the reward like, like he won it. And because of this dim-witted decision of his, uh, this catches the attention of Mugatu, who was looking for someone beef-headed enough to be brainwashed in order to assassinate the Prime Minister of Malaysia. And he does just that. He brainwashes Derek, and he has a trigger for him yeah. to go fucking psycho, and it's the song Relax. Yeah, so this is the, um, where the, uh, whatchamacallit, the, uh, Manchurian Candidate similarities, uh, come from, because the Manchurian Candidate is about the same thing, brainwashing people so they can do assassination with, like, the trigger words. It's the exact same thing, pretty much. So Derek has to work together with a reporter named Matilda, who has also caught wind of Mugatu's scheme, and work together with Hansel in order to protect the Prime Minister and stop Muga uh, Mugatu. And that's basically the plot of Zoolander. So what did we think? I think that, um, I'm not sure if I would say it's Ben Stiller's best movie, but it's his funniest Without a doubt to me, it is really fucking funny. Yeah, that's my take. I just think it's really fucking funny. Um, there's a great variety of jokes. The line deliveries are incredibly fun. Like, the line deliveries make, like, some of the line. I think, like, Zoolander might be the fun one of the funniest idiot characters I've ever seen in fiction. Like, it's like Derek Zoolander, like, Ed from Ed, Ed and Eddie. Like, those are probably the two funniest, like, dumbasses I've ever seen. <laughs> So many great gags, and again, the line delivery is really, really sells it. I'm gonna be honest, I'm, I'm more mixed on this movie. It has its funny moments for sure. I found the humor to be a bit more hit and miss. I will admit, uh, I think the movie in general was a bit more consistent by the end. At least I thought the jokes hit more. On the whole, I'm, I'm not sure. This movie didn't fully click for me. I didn't, I didn't hate it. I just thought it was okay. That's fair. Um, as a lot of jokes in it are like really like popular memes in pop culture, which threw me off when I first saw it because I was like, "Oh, I did not realize that I've already seen like half this movie just through like cultural osmosis before." And because like I also you, saw Lydia? the Manchurian Candidate, like this whole movie to me felt like it was something I've seen before. The fact that I saw the Manchurian Candidate probably made this movie funnier for me, by the way, because like there's some jokes in here that like make a, a really funny if you like see that movie but yeah so i never saw this movie before you guys had prior experience i didn't i also never saw I, the... i've never seen it this oh, was really? my first time i thought you did I'm yeah. the only one that's heard. no i was aware of it but i didn't know anything about it all right but um i've never seen this or the manchurian candidate so i went in with a fresh mind and it feels like a movie that i shouldn't like but i ended up 
really liking it anyway. It's kind of like Tommy Boy for me, where like the the main character is like kind of an idiot, and he has qualities that you don't really like about him. But at the end of the day, you kind of warm up to him. And most of the jokes were pretty funny. There were some that was like, okay, this this is taking it a little too far. But for the for the most part, I was having a good time. But like that that one joke though, where a after uh the their disguises starts to run out and they try to operate a computer and then they start acting like monkeys it's like oh okay, why oh yeah where it, they just yeah they need to turn on the computer and that extends into a parody of the opening of 2001 i'll admit that was one of the jokes that got a good laugh out of me i'm like it's so stupid but like it works because it's so outlandish and stupid that's the type of humor in this movie that I liked. Like, another joke that I thought was great was at the beginning of the movie when Derek is, like, in this depressing state, he walks home into his apartment, and you see a giant spoon on his wall as a reference to he wanted to become a model when he was eating cereal and saw his face. Like, that is great. Do you think Tommy Wiseau took inspiration from this movie? Possible. Probably not. No, I doubt it. Yeah, like, the outlandish humor, that's... That's the stuff that really hit with me. I thought it would be a bit more like that throughout. I thought it was, honestly. I don't know. Um, I don't know. Like, I guess like the... I mean, some of the Derek's friends like die the, by just having a stuff. gasoline fight. And someone just lights a I, cigarette. I mean, I guess like... Some of the romance stuff isn't like the most memorable. But like, I don't know. Even that's... I, I thought it was like... Pretty funny. Like, I can definitely see why some people wouldn't like it if like the Zoolander character doesn't like click with them because like the majority of the comedy is pretty much hinging on him like again with tommy boy if you don't think chris farley is all that funny in tommy boy you, you're probably gonna hate tommy boy i'm actually pretty mixed on tommy boy because like i kind of think it's funny but also like kind of don't so i'd have to rewatch it I, I do remember liking it though by the end I, I like it i like it i just don't love it but this i guess I it's just because really the general premise is so outlandish like hey let's link the fashion industry to assassinations like that is so bizarre but for, like, the first, like, 40 minutes, it's just Zoolander going from here to there. And I, I don't know. Really it, like... just, it, it just it just felt hit or miss for me. No, they still got the like, gears turning maybe anyway. Maybe like, Mugatu, maybe like, like, notices a, Zoolander. So, like, he knows, yeah, like, I want to go do. for this guy, and I need to get him no matter what. As a film narrative, I, I like, I get that, like, the first half probably doesn't really have much driving force. But, like, I still think it's, it's funny. Like, I, I won't say, like... Again, this is why I mentioned, like, I don't think, like, the story or anything is, is still your strongest. You know, Cable Guy and uh, Tropic Thunder obviously have, like, a much better story. But um, the comedy, I don't, th I think, like, works. It's just, like, the first half definitely feels more like you're kind of just watching, like, a sitcom starring Zoolander rather than, like, a film. And then the second half, once they start parroting the Manchurian Candidate, then it becomes, like, uh, more of an actual movie. I gotta say, though, at some points, I kind of underestimated uh Derek's stupidity because I I wasn't ready for the gag where like he's looking at the model of the uh the reading center for kids who can't read good and then he says like it needs to be bigger I'm like oh <laughs> I oh this is how stupid this character is okay but that that was funny that that was legitimately one of the funniest scenes and it I was just <laughs> taken aback by how fucking brain dead Derek is to move aside from Derek Zoolander for a second, uh, let's talk about Hansel. I swear this part was written for Matthew McConaughey. I mean, his first line is literally, all right, all right, all right. And he even has, he, he just feels like a Matthew McConaughey character. I don't uh, know, am I the only one? Yes, because uh, Owen Wilson was the first choice of Ben Stiller to be cast for Hansel. Really? Yeah, Owen Wilson really, was his it, first choice. Really? I, I love Owen Wilson, but this seemed like such a McConaughey role. I, I guess I could kind of see it. I don't know. I think Owen Wilson does a good enough job as Hansel. I'm saying Owen I'll Wilson has it. a... Again, I like Owen Wilson. Owen Wilson is, like, up there walking for me, where I think his voice is, like, naturally funny. I don't. He's in this movie, too. I don't think he ever did the wow. Well, like, I don't know. Christopher Walken doesn't always say, oh, God, oh... Like, he's not always like that in all his movies. No, but the thing about Christopher Walken is that his voice is always funny. Owen Wilson is like, he's a bit subtler. Like, his voice is funny, but it's a bit more of like a subtle kind of comedy where it's like, once you like pick up on it, you're like, oh, okay. Oh, so this is random, but there's one point in the movie where Derek's phone is ringing and he answers it. 
And at the same time, an extra in the movie answers their phone only to realize oh, it yeah. wasn't actually <laughs> that. I've never seen that in a movie before. And that just like caught me like, oh, yeah, like it's weird. Like, that I, was so you good. Think of, yeah, like you think that'd be such an easy gag that more movies would do it. But that's the only time I've ever seen it. I'm like, huh, I don't see that every every day. Also, Mila Jovovich is in this movie. We haven't seen her in quite a while. And this was before the Resident Evil movies, too. All right. Uh, what did you guys think about the father-son relationship after Derek uh, fails like... in the coal mines? I thought there was going to be a scene at the end where his father confronts him again, like, hey, I'm sorry. That doesn't happen? Does that ever happen in the sequel? No. I, I, I don't know. I haven't seen Zoolander 2. I don't know, but the sequel was made, like, like over a decade after. Like, it's, they're pretty un unrelated, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, Zoolander 2 was released 15 years after the first one. Like, I don't think they have anything to do with each other, really. But yeah, going back to your point, it is it is very strange how Derek and his father don't interact on screen after he says, you're dead to me. Get out of here. But, I mean, he he does see him do the uh the derelict walk. He does. But it, it, it kind of would have been nice to have that resolution between those two characters, like, in person. Anyway, um... Did, did you guys have a favorite scene in the movie as a whole, or...? I don't know. Because I, um, I would say mine was the, the walk-off between uh Derek and Tansel, and David Bowie's there to host it. I don't know if I'd have a favorite scene, but like I said, a lot of the moments I really liked were some of the isolated jokes. Like, again, the giant spoon on the wall, the extra answering the phone when he didn't have to. Like, small stuff like that stuck out to me. Like a favorite scene, but there's a lot of, like, moments throughout there just pretty funny to me, you know? Like I said, the James Marsden cameo caught me completely off guard. What, one of my favorite gags is, like, the, the why models? And he's like, are you serious? Like, the, that one you were talking about earlier, that's that's actually probably one of my favorite scenes. Yeah, and and the fact like that, that it was improv is even better. I wouldn't say, like, the, the when he goes to visit his family again. Like, that's not, like, the funniest scene or anything. But, like, that scene of him, like, that, like, image of him walking down the runway... Like, uh, walking, like, in the coal mines, I was, like, that cracks me up. Like, it's so, so good. I don't know. <laughs> like, that's one of the funniest visuals in, like, the flick. Like, where he... Especially because, like, in the background, you can see that there's, like, other people, and they're, like, watching him, and it's like, what the fuck's he doing? Who let this guy in here? Oh, I don't know. Overall, I... good movie. Thumbs up. Again, I'm surprised that I enjoyed this as much as I did. It, it feels like a movie that I shouldn't enjoy but like tommy boy like there there is a certain charm to it that i can't take away from i know what you mean by like you shouldn't enjoy though because like it seems like a pretty because like... it's a very it's a very stupid movie right and yeah, but like so is monty python and like everyone loves them I, yeah well I, I think monty python's different i feel like that's like airplane or the naked gun movies how how do leslie i explain Nils it? leslie leslie nielsen movies like are, are like really stupid honestly like there, it's really fun. Like I don't know. I I guess like the reason I don't get it is because like I know like you like Tropic Thunder. I so, like, I, I, I haven't you know. seen Tropic Thunder. You haven't? No. Oh. Okay. Well, Tropic Thunder and the Cable Guy. I I guess like the reason I didn't think I was gonna like because for years I never watched it, but then like after a while I was like, wait a second. I like Tropic Thunder. I like the Cable Guy. I like Ben Stiller. Why wouldn't I like Zoolander? And then I watched it and I liked it. So I was like, yeah, you know. Have you seen any of Ben Stiller's other movies? Uh, I might have. I might have to you take mean, a. Look you mean at directing this. wise? Yeah, ones where he was like a director, writer. No, I don't mean like Royal Ten Bombs, because like. I might have seen one other, but I, I'd have to look at a list. But um, again, like right, well, movies, enough, then, movies like The Naked Gun and Airplane, I feel like were written as gag first, story second, whereas. Movies like Zoolander and Tommy Boy are written as comedies, but there's more of a central focus around them, and it's about stupid characters doing stupid stuff. So I agree. I, I think like Tommy Boy and uh, Zoolander and like they're what I call like SNL movies. Like they're not SNL movies, but like I associate them with like a similar thing that SNL movies did, where it's about the they either want to highlight a character or highlight a performer. So, like, Zoolander, to me, is in a very similar space to, like, Wayne's World, where you're just kind of, it's focused on a goofy character, and that's what, like, the whole movie's about. Uh, I, I consider Zoolander to be operating, like, a similar space to, like, the Austin Power movies, although the Austin Power movies, you know, they're clearly, there's more of a plot to it, but, like, you know, when you look at Wayne's World, what's the story of Wayne's World? 
I don't remember. I just remember like the characters and like some of the little moments and throughout, you know. And uh, you know, obviously all these people, you know, worked on SNL. I don't know if Ben Stiller did, but like all the people that this movie reminds me of worked on SNL. Uh Ben Stiller, I think, had his own sketch show, so yeah, he didn't need to go to SNL because he had his own thing going on. The Ben Stiller show, which my dad tells me is good, but I have not seen it. Never mind. Like ben I, Stiller was like never mind. I was wrong. Ben Stiller was an SNL cast member. <laughs> He was in uh, 1989. He was, uh, for one year, he was on SNL, and then he went off and did his own thing. Like I said, I thought this movie was okay. It definitely had its funny moments, but as a whole, it just wasn't quite for me. And that's fine. You know, different it opinions. Is. I think I'd, I'd probably like this the most out of all of us. So Yeah, that, that sounds about right. Yeah, it's not bad. Just not my thing. I'm glad I finally got to see it, though, because I've been curious about it for a while. Ben Stiller directed Reality Bites? That's crazy. That's, like, not even, like, a comedy. That's, like, a... I mean, that's a comedy. That's, like... That's, like, art cred. Weird. I didn't realize that. Out of curiosity, Red, have you seen Zoolander 2? No, and I don't really have an interest. It seems like the I general consensus, anyway, is it's not as good it's as the original. Cash-in. It feels like... What it's, it, from what I heard, it's, like, one of those cash and sequels where they just kind of, like replay the hits from the first film and it's so it's like a a hoodwink to son of the mask garbage dump i don't know if it's like to that level but like i'm i'm heard it's it's not good it's like anchorman 2 kind of i guess but like worse than anchorman 2 i understand but it's like a similar deal where it's just kind of like it's more of a member berries thing you know rather than like a sequel Uh that like people really wanted again i remember money again you know money you know it's not even like Ghostbusters 2 where they're like capitalizing at it like right when like like it's clearly they just make Ghostbusters 2 for the money but like at least it was like you know relatively quick so like everyone's still this is the case where it. oh it's Vitality. over 10 years old it's technically a nostalgic property let's just do another yeah. one but also like all the actors they don't they like, clearly don't got like the same swagger and like you know not Ben Stiller like he's a good looking guy but like you know there's it's clear that like he's probably not gonna hit as much 10 years later and also like comedy styles change so much like, from what I understand, this movie's a lot more kind of crude and has got more of that, like, kind of, like, crude humor that wasn't really in the original Zoolander, but was popular in comedy movies that were released and, like, after. So, you know. Have anything else to add about Zoolander? I don't think so. Aside from uh, Derek Jr. is now a thing. And that might be prominent in the sequel. I don't know. All yep. right. So, Patrick, it's your turn. All right. Um, so, let me ask you guys. Would you be up for a two-for-one? A double feature? Depends. Depends on what? Uh, what's... What's on offer? Okay, this is gonna go either, like, one of three ways, because I have three ideas in mind. I'm really banking on the double feature, though. Okay. But if you don't want to, then... No, I'm interested. I'd I'd like to hear what they are. Okay, um... Well, I'm not gonna beat around the bush, um... This is something mm-hmm. I've wanted to do for a while, but it just the, the timing never felt right. I'm just going to go for it now. Um, this is an inverse Zoolander. It's a movie I like that you guys don't I want to do a double feature of The Cat in the Hat and Horton Hears a Who. Oh, fuck. I'm fine with that. I don't even hate Cat in the Hat. I like Cat in the Hat. Oh, it, yeah. I don't love it, but I... I, I... I mean, we'll do it, but just, just no... Why, why? Why would you do this? Okay, um, I've waited over a hundred episodes. I feel like I deserve this. We just did The Grinch not that long ago. No, then, I I'd argue because we saw The Grinch, we can compare and contrast, you know, fresh <sighs> in our heads. Well, here's the you, thing. Your idea. Here's, you don't get to complain here's about The Grinch. Here's the thing. Lugia, you recommended it. Here's the thing. I initially wanted to do just the cat in the hat, but I'm also like, you know what? The cat in the hat and Horton Hears a Who are the two Dr. Seuss adaptations I'm the most passionate about for completely different reasons. And I feel if I put Horton Hears a Who with the cat in the hat, it'd be kind of like softening whatever pain the cat in the hat does for you. I don't know about that. Listen, that that is a lot of childhood trauma you're re-exposing me to. Horton Hears a Who... 
he was voiced by Jim Carrey, so it'll be interesting to kind of compare how he does. You know, if you glitch, really, glitch, really glitch. don't want to do it, I can swap it out. No, but... I'll do it. You're but doing like, it. You but just, just no, you're opening a, a big can of worms here, my friend. This is the only time I'll ever have you watch the movie. I promise. <laughs> I doubt that. You think that's I bad? Promise. You what I promise. Prepared for next week. All right. So, yeah. All right. Look, this is. These are the only two Dr. Seuss adaptations I actually have an interest in ever giving an episode to, so... I'm surprised you didn't do the Lorax. That... I don't have an interest in the Lorax. It's a movie I like as a guilty pleasure, but I just never felt compelled to actually choose it. I'm fascinated by the Lorax because I think it's, like, one of the soulless films I've ever seen, but it's, like, soulless in such a weird way. That like now, I'm fascinated by The Cat in the Hat and Horton Hears a Who because I love both movies, but for completely different reasons. Which I will explain next week. They're both bad. Right. They're bad. How are we gonna? Employees. How are we gonna close this um, out? Blue steel. All right, you you guys scrunching up your faces. You, you doing the the blue steel face? Mm -hmm. I'm a model. Yeah. I don't I don't know how to end this. <laughs> what is? I'm gonna start reading Patrick. I'm gonna start reading Patrick Bateman lines in <laughs> Zoolander's voice. There are no more barriers to cross. I have in common with uncontrollable, insane, and vicious evil. All the mayhem I have caused and my utter indifference towards it have now been surpassed. My pain is constant and sharp. I do not hope for a better world for anyone. I think I contracted the black lung, Papa.